so we're going to have, well, this is a, our highlight, our session. Our final general, se our only general session, actually. And we will um, be having a heart healthy cooking demonstration, but we will also be having uh, a little talk as well. So, first, let me introduce Chinoa Farrell. Chinoa is a holistic health coach from Baton Rouge. As a mother, she was always searching for healthy meal and snack options for her family. And in 2012, she became a holistic health coach and turned her passion for healthy living into a career when she launched Feel Good Mama. Through Feel Good Mama, Chinoa offers private coaching and group classes. She has also had the opportunity to, to work closely with Whole Foods Market, the food sponsor for our demonstration today, and also the provider of your lunch. Yay, Whole Foods. We are also excited to have Dr. Darren Bro with us. Dr. Bro and I were just talking about the fact that we uh, grew up probably about nine miles from each other. I hail from St. Martinville, Louisiana, and the correct way to pronounce my name in Lafayette or Acadiana is Champagne. But people in Baton Rouge can't pronounce Champagne. So, and champagne, like Dr. Bro says, it has a little more class. It has a classy sound. It also has a little alcoholic sound, too. But uh, it's, it's so something funny was when I was working at, I went to USL in Lafayette, now UL, and I worked in the library, and all my bosses called me bubbly. So that was, that's, a, that's a little uh, anecdote about me. But Dr. Bro is a, an interventional cardio cardiologist with Baton Rouge Cardiology Center in Louisiana, having practiced there since 2002. He specializes in complex and high-risk coronary interventions and treatments for venous insufficiency, the varicose veins and spider veins that we had screenings for. He, uh, he can help you fix those, I guess, and some other conditions as well. Dr. Bro earned his um, undergraduate degree, his Bachelor of Science in pre-med at McNeese State University. I don't know why he didn't go to USL or UL, but he chose that. Maybe there was some pretty girl there. And his medical degree from Louisiana State University Medical Center in New Orleans, where he did uh, internship and residency as well. He completed his fellowship in cardiology at, uh, at the LSU Health Sciences Center in New Orleans. He's a fellow of the American Acotic College of, of Cardiology, a member of the American Heart Association, as I am as well, and Cardiovascular Research Foundation of Louisiana. He is board certified in cardiovascular disease. His offices are located in Baton Rouge, Gonzales, Lutcher, and he has privileges as men, at many of the hospitals in those areas. So I would like to turn it over to Dr. Bro, who will give you a, a, show, a, a presentation first. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I know. So oh. thank you, Kathy. I was, I was uh, pleasantly surprised to know that Kathy and I went to high school together. So nice to meet her, and I'm excited to team up with you know. <laughs> What a great looking crowd. Give yourselves a round of applause, guys, for being here. Appreciate you guys coming out today. So uh, I've given this presentation a few times, and uh, I've kind of come to learn about it, that it's a little bit complex uh, when we start talking about know your numbers. So what I'd like to do is it, we're going to focus on some things you probably already know. What factors put you at risk for heart disease? Nowadays, most people know those things, but I want to take it to the next step, and I want you to have the power and education so that when you go to your physician, you can understand a bit of what we go through in our minds, the thought process, and maybe uh, give you some ammunition to ask some intelligent questions about some more specific things. So know your numbers. So now, it gets very complicated, though, so, so I'm going to make an analogy for you. It, maybe, no, no offense by this comment, but maybe if there were a bunch of men in here, this analogy might go over better. But uh, we, we're familiar with the stock market, right? Stock market? 
So let's say a guy goes to his, his, uh, his financial guy and he says, listen, I want to invest for my future. I want to be secure in my future when I retire. Uh, should I invest aggressively or should I invest in a bunch of bonds? So what, what's the answer there? What's the answer? Well, you, you kind of hit on the point here. You can't answer the question because I really didn't tell you a crucial, crucial piece of information, right? So let's say the guy's 21 years old and just got out of college. He's got his first job. He has no children. He's not married. Yeah. What if the guy's 62 years old and he's going to retire in, in two years? So the answer's different, isn't it? Why is the answer different? The answer is different because it depends on who the person is. So that's the analogy I want you to understand when I go through these, these slides. The numbers are not the same for everyone. It depends on who the person is. So when you look at numbers that we're going to show you, I want you to think to yourself, who am I as the patient? Where do I stand in the mix? And then you can assess what your number should be. And that really holds true for most of the things we'll tell you today. So just an overview on risk factors. Most of you know this. Uh, we like to group it into modifiable, non-modifiable risk factors. You know, so we really focus in on the modifiable risk factors because you really can't pick your genes. You can't pick your age. Okay? So you're really focused on things that you can alter. Okay? So let's talk about the first one, blood pressure, hypertension. The most common risk factor that we see in the office. Uh, one out of every three Americans will have hypertension, and it substantially increases your risk of having a heart attack, stroke, congestive heart failure, kidney failure, a number of different other things. So very, very important to know what your blood pressure is and what it should be. OK. So remember this. You can't just say, I feel fine. My blood pressure is fine. OK. Some people will have symptoms when their blood pressure goes up, but the vast majority of people will not have any symptoms. So you have to check your blood pressure, okay? You have to check it to know if, if it's elevated, okay? So that's the most important point. Here's some people at risk. Uh, African Americans, I'll highlight, specifically have more significant risk from hypertension and cardiovascular disease. Number of people are, are at risk. So let's get down to the meat and potatoes. And I want to spend a little time on this because some of this is new. Did anybody hear recently in the newspaper the news about new blood pressure goals? Yep, right? So, I mean, how does that work? I mean, does, does like three guys drinking a beer say, hey, let's change the numbers. Let's, let's change those numbers and freak everybody out. No, what happens is that we get new information, new data, new clinical data to say, you know what? We did this clinical trial. Now, look, it seems that if we lower the numbers more, then we can help people uh, better, reduce your risk further. So the, as time goes on, that's why things change. So that's what happened. New clinical data says, you know what? This, this should be the new goals for people. So remember the old goal, 140 over 90. Remember that? Well, that's still a goal. OK, so what we found out, though, that certain populations now benefit if their blood pressure is, what, 130 over 80 or less. So don't get too consumed in the chart. OK, I don't, I don't want this to be like you got to memorize all this chart. But remember, it depends on who you are, right? So not everyone needs to strive for a goal on medical management for 130 over 80, OK? But you think about it like this. The people who are at the most risk should be more aggressive to lower their blood pressures to lower. Because the, 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 the implication is more substantial for those people, if that makes sense. So if, if you understand that concept, that applies to most of the conceptual differences between groups and why you strive for different numbers. OK, so if you wanted to memorize numbers or write it down, so here's what I'll tell you. OK, nobody should have a blood pressure. 140 over 90 or higher. Nobody. OK, everybody needs to be absolutely less than that. Certain populations should be less than 130 over 80. Who are those patients? Well, 
What if you already have the disease? Well, of course you're at high risk, right? You had a blockage, you had a stent, you had a stroke. That's easy, right? So those are the highest risk patients, okay? What about if you got diabetes? Yeah, that's a big one too. Chronic kidney disease. So those are specific groups that we know should be less than 130 over 80. By the way, that's old data. We've always known that. Here's the new main difference. If we perceive or we calculate that your risk in the next 10 years is greater than 10%, you don't have to memorize this, okay? But this is for your doctor to do. Then if you fall in that category, but you're not the other people I just mentioned, then you can justify your blood pressure being 130 over 80 or less by medical treatment, okay? So, but if you don't have a blockage, you had a heart attack or stroke, you never had a stent, you don't have diabetes, you don't have chronic kidney disease, you're not 10-year, 10% risk, then you don't fall into the category per se. In other words, if you go to your doctor, your blood pressure is 135 over 85, he's not going to start a medicine. Now, he's going to tell you, look, low salt diet, exercise, weight reduction, et cetera, et cetera, right? And he wants your blood pressure to be less than 130 over 80, but he's not going to start a medicine over it. So I don't want to get too complicated about that, but I just want you to understand that not, the numbers don't apply to everybody the same way. So I think with this in mind, a practical thing to do is to assess who you are. Okay, you might fall into the category that it's obvious that your blood pressure needs to be 130 over 80. If not, you should ask your doctor, Doc, do I fall into the risk category where my blood pressure should be less than 130 over 80? So that's what I think is practical for you to do rather than memorizing you know, some of this stuff. But if you really wanted to drill down on it, there is a risk calculator. Uh, you can get it off the uh, internet, the American uh, Heart Association Risk Cal Calculator. If you want to come talk afterwards, I'll show you. I'll plug you into the, the system, help you understand where you stand. You need to know some variables like your blood pressure, your cholesterol, etc. But you could do it. You could take that far if you'd like to. So um, any questions about this? I do. Yes, ma'am. So what's your question, ma'am? What's your question? Yeah, great point. So remember, when we're, when we're going through this, guys, you can't hurt people by doing this either. And there are some nuances, whether it's blood pressure, cholesterol, diabetes, where you might say to, you, to this patient, ma'am, I know that you should be this number. But I'm not going to do that because if I do that, I'm scared I'm going to hurt you. So it's a great point to make that, you know, it, it, all things being equal, if you can strive for that goal and not, and, and not cause harm, then that's a, a qualifying statement that, that's a good point to make. Okay, so let's move on a little bit. Let's talk about cholesterol a little bit. So uh, there's that cool commercial that had come out a while back, like, you know, the guy's jogging down the street and his cholesterol's on his back of his shirt, you know, 140 or 250 or whatever. Yeah, everybody's seen that commercial? Okay, good, good. So cholesterol is very, very important risk factor for cardiovascular disease. So this is something we really, really pay attention to very closely. 47% uh, of Americans are considered to have a cholesterol that's too high. Uh, and, and so this is super important. So here's a little chart to help you understand. Same principle applies. Doc, what should my cholesterol be? The doc says, well, who are you? Okay, so ask yourself first, who am I? What category do I fall into? Then you'll know what your goal is for cholesterol. So but here's some charts, I know this is busy, and you probably see this on your report, like you get a lab report, right? And it says reference range. Don't pay attention to that, because really, I mean, you can't really give a document. It'd be seven pages long for you to help figure out what your cholesterol should be. They try to do that, but the reference range is, is, I think, sometimes confusing to people because it really doesn't tell you who you are, right? So, but here's how you get started with this, okay? 
this is a break point number right here. And what we're talking about is LDL, bad cholesterol. L stands for what? Lousy. Lousy. Or what? Low. You want it low. That's the LDL. That's the bad stuff. You don't want that stuff in your body. Okay? So you want as little as possible, I should say. So uh, LDL break point 100. Remember that, that number. But same principle, okay? Who needs to be less than 100 versus who can be over 100? Well, the highest risk people, again, you want to lower the number, right? Who's the highest risk? Well, how about you already got the disease, like we mentioned, same category, right? You already got the disease. You're the super high risk. Absolutely, your number should be less than 100, okay? But if you don't have the disease, the more factors you have that might create the disease, then you're walking down this line where, okay, now look, I could be between 100 and 129 LDL. I don't have the disease, but maybe I have hypertension, for example or I'm 60 years old. That's a risk factor, age, right? So, but like, let's say you're 20 years old and you don't have any medical problems. Well, we don't insist on driving your LDL that low. So that would be an example of somebody who could have an LDL of 150. So just understand that point, same principle. Who are you as a person, okay? So, but a lot of people in this room, I think probably uh, would qualify for an LDL of less than 100. And I'll tell you who they are. You got the disease. You got a blockage, you had a stent, you had a heart attack, you had a stroke, okay? You got diabetes. When we talk in medical terms, diabetes we consider the equivalent of having the disease, okay? Uh, that's how powerful a risk factor diabetes is. So, you, so diabetes is in that category less than 100, okay? So those two you could remember like, okay, yeah, I, I got that. My LDL should be less than 100, okay? If you don't have those, then it's more flexible. Now, I'm not saying your doctor might say, look, your risk is such that I want your LDL less than 100, and you ought to take this pill. That'd be a clinical judgment that's not wrong, okay? And the truth is, the lower your LDL cholesterol, the less your risk is going to be, no matter where you start. So sometimes a guy might, you know, do some things that are a little bit different than the chart, and it's not wrong, okay? But I want you going into your doctor saying, who am I, what is my LDL, and what is my goal? So know, know those now. Here's a special consideration that's not on the chart. I'll take it even further. Who is higher risk than even I stated? Okay, let's say you had a heart attack, you had a stroke, you had a bypass surgery, you had a stent, rather than just you had a blockage you're treating medically, okay? If you fall into those categories, we actually drive the LDL down less than 70. Okay, so just to illustrate the point about the risk of the patient really dictates how low you drive the LDL cholesterol. Does that make sense? Okay. So not everybody's the same. So know who you are. Know what your goal is. Yes, ma'am. The one number generally is going to be the total cholesterol. And, you know, um, it's not practical to do the full panel here, so that's why that's done. And, you know, the total cholesterol, we, we know that generally it should be less than 200, but I wouldn't only rely on that. I would, I would say to myself, look, I'm going to get a full panel. I want to know all these numbers because really it helps you uh, be much more insightful about what the patient's risk is. So, so we do total here just as a practical matter to help people be in tune. Like, let's say you had a total cholesterol 250 then you would say, oh, geez, I need to go to my doctor and get the whole pan. I better go over there, you know. So it's more of an awareness thing, and it's, a, you know, that, that's, that's why we do that. Okay, we're going to move along here, guys. And uh, so, uh, you know, we're not going to talk a lot about how to do cholesterol management or even blood pressure management, but in our next lecture, uh, Ms. Cheneau is going to kind of go into detail about nutritional aspects, et cetera. So we won't talk too much about that. High sugar or diabetes, this is a very important risk factor. Diabetes has double or triple the risk of the other factors that I just mentioned to you, okay? Very, very powerful driver of cardiovascular disease, uh, stroke, amputations, neurologic diseases, etc. So very, very important. Okay? So this slide you can't really see, but we measure hemoglobin A1C. Anybody familiar with that, hemoglobin A1C? Okay, it's a method to understand what the sugar's been in the last three months, basically. Same principle. What should my number be? Well, first question, who am I? Okay. 
So here's some numbers for you. Generally speaking, 7%. This is the number that most people uh, want to focus on, okay? Uh, and so, so that's what I would try to remember if I were you. I want my hemoglobin A1C to be less than 7%, okay? Uh, now, you pay attention to other things, too. What's my preprandial, postprandial blood sugar, et cetera? You're going to be checking that, too. And there's some numbers here that, you know, you generally want to be, you know, less than 130, okay? Uh, and so, so that's, that's important, too. The hemoglobin A1C is vitally important. And so here's the, uh, here's the other part of this. Like, who am I? If I'm not the average person, maybe it'll be different, right? So you can uh, justify maybe more stringent control, 6.5 even, in certain populations, like if you hadn't had it, diabetes that long, or if you're, you're younger, have a longer life expectancy, you don't have any cardiovascular disease, that's a little bit different, isn't it? Then less than eight in a higher risk population. The reason is, is because in these higher risk populations, if you shoot for too stringent, you're gonna cause harm. Like this young lady mentioned, sugar too low. We wanna avoid that. We can harm people, and generally, if you have more complex medical conditions, then we're afraid that we're going to do that. But just understand the point. Again, seven for the average population, but that might be different for certain people. But ask your doctor, doctor, based on who I am, what is our goal for my hemoglobin A1C? Okay, so that's, that's the, you know, the, 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 the practical nature of this for you to have a conversation with your doctor. So this serves as a starting point, hopefully. Okay, so uh, we talk about smoking. Well, I don't have a number for smoking, but I'll tell you what the number is. <laughs> Bubkas, zero, none, no smoking. That's an easy one, right? Smoking is frustrating because it's the number one modifiable risk factor for cardiovascular disease, but it's the most difficult to get control over, honestly. And so uh, it's a very, very difficult thing. But your goal is a zero. That's an easy number to remember, right? Your goal is zero smoking, okay? All right, let's move on here, guys. So one more. How about body mass index? Anybody familiar with that? Okay. So it's a kind of a measure of, of overweight, right? You can't use the same number for everybody. Like, hey, I'm 150 pounds. Is, is that normal? Well, how tall are you? I mean, you know, if you're six foot seven, then you're underweight. If you're five foot one, then you're overweight. So you can index it to that, to height. Okay, and there's a calculation here. You can do this if you want. I did mine today. I'm, I'm 23. <laughs> Whew. I thought I was overweight. Everybody's overweight, right? I take my dog to the, to, the, to the vet, and he's like, he's overweight. I'm like, he's a dog, come on. You know, he's cute, you know, he's cute, he's chubby, he's cute, you know. So uh, anyway, so, but you can do this calculation, and here's your numbers that you want to be, okay? If you're between 18.5 and 24, this is the index of your weight to your height, body mass index, okay? That's where you want to be. That's what you should strive for. So between 18 and 24.9, or roughly 25, okay? Okay, so how about physical activity? Here's your goal, 20 to 30 minutes, five days a week. That's a lot, right? It's like, geez, who's going to do that? Well, you could do it. But here's the point I always make. Be practical, right? Just have that as your goal and get as close to it as you can every week, okay? If you get, if you get 60, 60 hours... Okay, next week I'm going to try for 150, okay? But you've got to have a goal, right? You've got to have a goal to shoot for. Every week you should be shooting for this goal. So that's going to roughly work out about 30 minutes, five days a week, okay? 25, 30. I'll take anything I can get, frankly, but this is your number that you're shooting for on physical activity and exercise, okay? And, and this comes from data that looked at you'll live longer. You'll reduce your risk of cardiovascular disease, et cetera. So that's an important goal. That's, that's not just made up. Okay. Okay. So I won't talk in detail about healthy diet, but our next speaker is going to go into more detail. And I'd encourage you to ask her some questions about specifics about nutrition. So she's a great resource for that. And she'll talk to you about those numbers. And so uh, I'm going to give the floor to her right now and we'll entertain any questions after she's done with her lecture. Thank you guys. <clears throat> Hello. Hello. <laughs> Hello. So, here we go. Feel good, Mama. I want to tell you a little bit about my story. About seven years ago, 
I was told I had gallstones. Well, I knew I had them because they're incredibly painful. Anyone? You know when you have them. And, you know, I just got sick and tired of being sick and tired. You get to that point. You get motivated. Your body's talking to you, and you start to listen. So I began my um, training as a health coach with the Institute for Integrative Nutrition. And over the year-long program, I began to adopt the lifestyle and diet recommendations. I began to um, play around with different ideas about what proteins were best for me and what um, composition I needed to have them um, as it went with carbohydrates and fats. And I've noticed that I keep changing. We're going to talk about bioindividuality today. But I now understand my own bioindividuality to a certain degree. But three years ago, I thought I was doing great. I was feeling wonderful. I had all the energy in the world. And then my father passed away suddenly. So one of another major component of what can cause heart disease is stress. So I experienced a lot of grief that turned to stress. And I now know that I should have gone to counseling. But this is the first time in three years that I've spoken about it publicly without crying. So what that tells me is, is that the process is over, but yet I've inherited yet another illness, which I'm working through right now, which is an autoimmune disease. Does anyone know about um, hypothyroidism? Yes. So I'm struggling with that right now. But we're going to talk about how to use food as medicine. I know what to do, and I'm doing it, and I'm getting better. So that's my story. This is my why. This is my daughter. I want her to inherit better habits that led me down a path of disease. OK? So they're watching you. That's my motivation. And my intention today is to empower you, to have you leave here fired up, ready to take action. Be part of your own rescue. Um, be part of a wellness team alongside of your doctor. And partner with a wellness coach such as myself to help bridge the gap between what you know and what you do. It's easy enough to take the recommendations that Dr. Bro would give you, but what are you going to do when you leave? You're going to get home, feel overwhelmed, and likely have trouble. So that's where health coaches come in. So what we're going to talk about today, and I hope that you learn, is how to eradicate, eradicate harmful habits, how to implement healthy ones, and how to take action. Because it matters not to know. It matters everything to do. Am I right? OK. How are the New Year's resolutions going? Anybody still on track? Hey, two, three, four? Well, good for you. Well, that's why we're also going to talk about why it's not about willpower. It's about habits. It's not about the willpower, and then you feel the shame and the regret, and then it's just this vicious cycle that goes on and on and on. And that can make you sicker as well, because it's stress. Ever notice also when you make a New Year's resolution and people are bringing donuts everywhere you go? It's like you have a, a new car and then everybody's driving that car. You're like, you never noticed it before. It tests your resolve, right? You put that intention out there and you're going to get tested. So you need to make a plan. That's what a health coach can help you do. If you have a plan, and then you need to discover what your obstacles are too, so that you have a plan and then the donuts pass by and you have an apple instead. Oops, I went back. So habits. There's a wonderful book out there that I recommend. Um, it's very relatable. It's an easy read. It's really um, interesting. It's called The Power of Habit by Charles Duhigg. And he's pulled in cutting edge um, information on psychology and neuroscience. He studied a lot of big brands to see how they're getting you to buy their products and identified 
um, the cue, routine, and reward as a habit loop. So in, in psychology, they, they call it the habit loop, which is the brain and the way that it, it works through a um, habit, essentially. So you have a cue, donuts, cue donuts. You have your routine. Are you going to follow the donuts and eat the donut? I keep doing that. Um, or are you going to have the apple for the reward? We're going to talk about how one of my tips is that you need to, in, to interrupt this harmful habit, you plug into the routine. Does that make sense? So that, that's where the plan comes in. Without a plan, you're just out there in the wind. You heard about inflammation? It is the cause of chronic disease. Everything you do is either anti-inflammatory or inflammatory. So what is inflammation? It's the body's immune system trying to heal you. But it can get confused, and it can be an inflammatory negative response, and it can start, like in my condition right now, attacking your thyroid tissue. And that's because of my particular case, I have a gluten intolerance. And I've also been under stress for such a long time. So we really need to look at what we can do daily to either be anti-inflammatory or inflammatory. And one of the biggest contributors to inflammation in the body is sugar. Sugar. Um, we talked a little bit about diabetes and heart disease. So the World Health Organization recommends no more than six teaspoons a day of added sugar. So if you think about a can of soda, which is 39 grams, you have to divide by four, you're looking at about 10 teaspoons, almost 10 teaspoons in just one soda. One soda. You never have just one, right? And then you have to tack on every boxed, processed food that you eat, that little bit of sugar in your, in your coffee. Everything adds up. You just don't really realize it until you start to read labels. And when we get to the tips, we're going to go through that a little bit more. So also, in, insert the habit loop, the routine, is sugar. And why? makes us feel good. It gives us energy, right, for a moment. Anybody have the 3 p.m. slump at work? How am I going to get to 5? You know, I used to have that. So fatigue, headaches, mood swings. I mean, none of this is something that we want to experience in life, is it? No. It's borrowed energy. Sugar is borrowed energy. And it is giving us serotonin, dopamine, all those feel-good hormones that tranquilize us, make us feel like we're in love, right? I always tell people, if you're going to go for the sugar, have your alternative, but maybe go and get, get, get a hug because you get, an, you get an endorphin kick with that as well. Make a friend today. Hug somebody new or somebody that came with you and, and do it, and it's a little awkward. 30 seconds, you really get the, the hit that way. It does get awkward. I, but it's worth it. Give it a try. See how it feels. Because it, it matters that you're connected to something as well. Again, if you're just out there in the wind, all by yourself, sometimes we eat because we're bored, right? Or we're sad. So if we're connected, we're less likely to go for that dopamine hit endorphin hit. So make no, absolutely 100% you need to understand this truth. Sugar is an addictive, destructive substance. Do not believe anything else. Even eating a small amount causes a craving for more. I've had the experience with my daughter. We eat stellar at home. I make her an organic wrap with all of the things in it, and she trades it for a Pop-Tart. <laughs> and then she comes home, 
and doesn't want to eat this meal again. And I wonder, what well, you were eating it yesterday because it, ma it happened so quickly. So it matters that you really, really do something about this. You make a plan, you change the routine, put an apple in place, get a hug. So here's, you also need to be reading your labels. They're, they are smart, they want your money, they, they make things addictive. Be, be aware, be a food detective, you know? Realize that all of these different names add up to sugar as well. Here's some natural sweeteners, one step above, right? One step above. They actually do provide some trace minerals. They're um, less of a higher glycemic index. And so always read your labels. So the very best solution for a sweet treat would be fruits and sweet vegetables, like sweet potatoes. We're going to have some uh, peppers in our wrap today. We're going to have some carrots. That would be an, an option to have some sweets. But you're also getting fiber. And fiber slows down the process of digestion so that you do not get this spike in your blood sugar. And then your pancreas freaks out, tries to grab it all with the insulin, inflammation. That's the process in a nutshell. So if, again, if you change the routine and you put something in its place, it's a double win. You, you've taken out a, an inflammatory piece and you've put in an anti-inflammatory piece, double whammy. <coughs> All right, so I have some tips for you. Use food as medicine. Isn't this beautiful? You're going to get a camera on here to really see it, but colors, colors, colors. Set realistic goals and don't go it alone. Again, be part of your own rescue. I came across that statement last night. I don't remember. It just came to me. I think I've heard it in a comedy routine or something. But be part of your own rescue. You are part of that process. You're either going to maintain where you are or you're going to get sicker and sicker and sicker. You could even completely heal. It's available to some of us, to most of us. So, food is medicine. They have, it's great, go on their website, they have a challenge for you. Take their challenge. Take the pledge. Um, too much salt intake, as we, do we mention that? We're mentioning it. Causes hypertension. Ma'am? You know, I, I kind of think it might be addictive as well. I mean, we... It, Either it's a habit loop, I haven't actually looked into that, but I feel happy when I have it, so likely I'm, it, it is an addictive substance as well. But so much of that salt that we're getting, if we're not eating foods like this and chopping them ourselves, they're coming from our canned foods, the processed foods, restaurant foods. By cooking for ourselves, either fresh or frozen, there's your sweet spot. Fresh or frozen. Now when we're talking frozen, you can get cauliflower rice at Whole Foods frozen, and you can get a lot of vegetables frozen, but I need to do my um, PSA, my public service announcement. Please do not microwave the bags. Please, please, please. An alternative would be to put it in a bowl, put a little water in there, put a lid on it, like a, even a plate. You don't need anything fancy. Switch to that because the plastic that you're ingesting that comes through when it's heated up is horrible for you. So there's my PSA. It has to be said. So water retention is an issue, right? So one of the, the mechanisms at play here is sodium and potassium levels. When your sodium level is way too high and there's not enough potassium 
to kick it out of the body, that removes it from the body, that's when you have a problem. Where does potassium come from? In particular, even salmon, have some canned salmon, and I'm gonna talk about plastic a little bit, the BPA-free canned uh, salmon. Don't even have to cut the skin off. This is my new favorite form of salmon. But also avocado and spinach, which is gonna go in your wrap today. Banana, sweet potato, and acorn squash, to name a few. Any of those sound good to you that you think you can add on? I mean, that's a no-brainer, avocado, and spinach, to start adding that in. And making it fresh or frozen, and you're really attending to this problem like that. So f food is medicine, eat a rainbow. Colors, 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 colors. I know some of you wanna ask, oh, which vegetables are highest in this, but you know, if you're eating an array on a regular basis, if you're looking at the sales, and I recommend, by the way, that you download the Whole Foods app, you'll get alerts to all their sales. And when you're shopping in any grocery store, the sale items in the produce section, those are the ones that are in season. So you don't have to memorize anything, you just respond to what's on sale, and you're on point. Or even the farmer's market is an opportunity too, because that is absolutely local and um, seasonal. And why we wanna eat seasonally is because as the climate changes, our needs change. When we have fat in our bodies, it, it does have one way of helping us because it insulates us, and which was great, it was really cold this winter, right? But what you really wanna do is just focus on colors, and lots of colors, and remember that the fiber, have you all heard about the microbiome? and the health of your gut, it's everything. And if you're not feeding those good bacteria plenty of fiber, they're not working for you. And you're likely to have an, uh, a, um, a yeast overload, and that can be the cause of a lot of ailments as well. So eat a rainbow and focus again on what? Fresh color and fresh or frozen. Okay, this is how we do it. You wanna eradicate a uh, harmful habit and put in a healthy one? It's the routine. It's the routine. Know your cues. Know your cues, know your obstacles. Like what is your challenge? A lot of times that cue is an emotional response to something that you know is gonna happen or that you don't know that's gonna happen. Road rage can happen and you might pull over and get a candy bar to handle it. I've heard of my clients doing that. But what I've done for them is I said, put in your purse an alternative so that when, those, when life happens on the go like that, you have a plan to overcome that obstacle, to keep you on track, because it matters. If you fall back one step, then you gotta work a little harder to get back to where you were, and it's just not worth it, right? And set realistic goals, that's a huge one. In my program, I do a one month, a three month, and a six month. So you have these big ideas of where you wanna be, you have a vision of where you wanna be in six months, and it typically takes that long. But then you have these small wins, these baby steps, where you've actually made a huge step in the right direction, but it might be minuscule, but you need to celebrate that, right? Create new positive routines. We've spoken about that. Celebrate your wins, however small. Celebrate today that for some of you, your routine would have been to go for fast food at lunch. You're at the drive-thru, so you didn't do that, and then you ate Whole Foods wrap. So that's a double win. Do you see how that works? And this is huge. There's a lot of different diets that come out and we get excited or we get confused really. We don't get excited anymore. It's stressful. It's like, I've been doing it wrong. And the truth is, is that we really need to tie into and believe in bioindividuality. We are all different. 
And we all are at different ages. We're all either in an avid state of disease or we're halfway there or we're all the way there and we're in a maintenance level. So it's really important that you tap into your inner wisdom. You pay attention to the way that certain foods make you feel. And it's very much easier to work like when, with a food diary to have someone have eyes on it alongside of you to help you understand what's going on. And that's where a health coach comes in. So no one size fits all. And I think that's it. And I'm going to do the wrap. Do we have any questions before I do that? So why is it fried? What is the question? Well, this is... There we go. Yes, how does your food make you feel? Right? Or, yeah, well, or, you know, well, here's the deal. You need to eat food that loves you back. Don't take borrowed energy with a soda. Get some real food. And you know, for the, for the 3 p.m. slump, all your body's looking for is energy. Sugar is energy. But if it can't be converted properly, if we're overloading our bodies, and we don't have the mechanisms, we haven't evolved to be able to handle all this processed food that has really been only in the market for 120 years, you know, our bodies have not caught up, you know? So it's very important to think about eating food that loves you back. And for me, gluten does not love me back. And now I've recognized that, I've gotten real real with it, and I feel 100 times better. Yes, ma'am. Right. She's asking about the powdered drinks. I would say read your label. Because not, they're not all created equal. Read their, a lot of them are full of sugar. Um, some of them are soy based, which does not work well for many, but some can tolerate it. You got to know the ingredients and really, really understand what's going on there. You were next. <laughs> okay. Absolutely. And you know, um, mm -hmm. well, you know, you can get blood work to see where your you know, nutritional level is for a lot of those. And I think it's more, it's, it's important to get that information understood. Because you shouldn't just take supplements just because you heard that, you know, vitamin D, typically vitamin D everybody should get a little help with, but know your numbers and you can actually get tested for that. You don't want to buy something until you know you need it because especially if it's a fat soluble um, supplement or uh, vitamin, it can be toxic if you take too much of it. So you really have to be careful and it's better to know, I like to think of it this way, you have potholes. For me, I, if I'm stressed, it takes all the magnesium out of my body. I can feel it, and I put it back in. I try to eat as much as I can naturally, but the digestive process can be difficult for me and for other people, so you really need to be paying attention to that. Um, so to answer that question, get tested, really understand where you're at, and don't guess. Test, don't guess. And are you there? Who? Or, well, you can get tested from your, um, your regular doctor, if you will, under insurance for that. You can find a functional medicine practitioner that can order more extensive labs. That is not covered by insurance. There's the rub. Um, but you can. I got tested for 
A, D, uh, what else is a common? Um, well, all the, yes, all of those, um, but most doctors will call for it if you ask for it, right? So ask for it. Right. Well, that's probably a mechanism because how does, why does it make her tired when she has sugar? I, I don't understand that mechanism. Doctor? So when she's feeling tired when she has sugar, that's because what's happening there? Well, there could be a rebound effect where if you eat sugar, you stimulate your pancreas to secrete insulin. And insulin drives sugars into your cell to regulate your sugar in the bloodstream. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so you, you may drive the sugar too low at several hours after you eat a high sugar meal. And that's, you know, you know that, right? You eat a donut at 8 and you get hypoglycemic at 11. Mm -hmm. All right? Because it drops profoundly. You can be very symptomatic. Uh, or you could get fatigue later on. Right. Did, did that answer your question? <laughs> well, I think that the safest bet is always going to be to eat live food and you know what's really interesting is that frozen food can sometimes even have more nu nutrient value because inter interesting enough to get it to look this good when it gets to the store they often have to pick it 10 days before ripeness so they flash freeze a lot of frozen and you know the great thing is is you can just reclose the bag take out a little bit and you're not losing out on anything going bad i think i have time for one more question and then i have a um, demo yes ma'am <laughs> oh, I love it. Love it. Love it. Love it. I actually drink it every day because of the where I'm at right now. I'm healing what's called a leaky gut. Some, sometimes I do. The question is, what do you think about bone broth? I apologize. Um, it's a wonderful, wonderful thing for some. Some people are vegetarian, so... That's a big topic. I think investigate it on your own and come talk to me later if, you, if you're interested in hearing about it. Um, but I use it as a soothing mechanism and a rebuilding opportunity. The collagen is really great for my gut to heal it. Um, I'd recommend that you look into it and make that decision on your own. It's just bone broth. Bone broth. So if we can have the camera Please, Jacob, Jacob, thanks Jacob. And here's this. So, is that good? So we talked about, these are two alternatives, the sweet vegetables. And all I'm gonna do here is just show you what I do at home to make a salad topper. I, I pick three different colors. And I have a salad base. Another one that works really great is romaine lettuce. It has a lo long life cycle, so you can do it on Monday. Keep in mind, you need to cut the romaine with a ceramic knife, or it will turn brown. So get a ceramic knife, prep on Sunday for the whole week. So imagine that there's um, some romaine lettuce in here. So you got spinach, you have a three-tone salad. Keep in mind that Cucumbers are going to go bad first, so get hearty ones that can share longevity together, like this pepper. Just kind of dice it up. Don't love on it too much. Um, you can also get zoodles. Y'all tried those yet? They're, um, you get zucchini. You have this. I think the woman who did, the, the nurse who did one of the talks was talking about it. Don't step into that role first. Don't get a zoodle maker first. Go to Whole Foods. They have them already done. So all I'm going to do here is I'm going to shred it. Oftentimes, if you make it smaller, you're more likely to eat it. Or with kids, it's really a great way to sneak it in. Sneak it into any kind of meal. So that's all that you do there. Get a carrot. Do the same. Another thing that works really well, too, is the uh, broccoli. Cauliflower, you can just buy that already riced. You know, one of the things of convenient food that it's actually healthy. So, 
So a salad topper, you have a salad base and a salad topper, and then you put it in a plastic bag and you just grab and go all throughout the week. Okay, and then the chicken salad, it's no specific recipe, I think a good two cups of the chicken, and I just broiled it. No, no fat, added fat, just broiled it. You can do it any way you like, grill it. So two cups of that and about a cup of Greek yogurt. I think you had Greek yogurt, and that's why I have it today. You had that in your wrap. Did it taste good? Yes. It's a nice alternative. And it's probiotic. We talked about the microbiome, so you're feeding the good guys. They're going to work well for you. And then I got some, some more sweet um, produce for you, some grapes, healthy omegas with the, um, the nuts. And you can use, you can get this a whole food, spike, salt free. Rely on herbs. It's just a herb blend with no salt. And you can get this at Whole Foods as well. So just put however much season to taste. And if you can do salt, then do salt. And that's all. Just mix it around. And you know, if you don't like it as wet as it is in this recipe, just it, there's no right or want, wrong way. You know what the best kind of exercise is? The one you'll do. <laughs> so if you need more or less chicken or more or less yogurt, do it. Don't, don't rely on a recipe. Rely on your likes and dislikes, but make the ingredients really healthy. OK. Similar, yes. I didn't get the full recipe, so I sort of winged it. And that's the thing, too. If things are in season, wing it. Don't overthink it. But if you get like a, a tritone, a three-tone, look how beautiful that is. And that's going to go in your body. You don't even have to think about it. You've already attended to eating a rainbow. Easy peasy. Again, this is in a plastic bag, and you're just grabbing and going every day on your way out of the house. Well, it, it'll last with the yogurt, usually as long as it'll last the yogurt in its own container, I would think. I mean, I, I make it for like three days, right? So you just make another batch, just keep the, you know, everything separate or just freeze these. Okay, I was going to do an avocado too for some nice healthy fat. I eat avocado every day. I like to use this avocado because it, it, it spreads really nicely. And I don't have, I didn't bring, that's what I forgot. I knew I'd forget something, a fork. So at home, what I would do is I would scoop this out and I would spread it around, put a little lemon juice on it so it doesn't brown. And then I'd put everything on this. Another thing that would work well would be hummus or um, cream cheese. And that just will help the wrap stay closed for you. So on my Lazy Susan here, any Susans? I think this is terrible that they call it a Lazy Susan. <laughs> any Susans? No? Okay, so it's just, it's really super simple. You already have this made up. I recommend that you do this in the morning before you go out of the door because this wrap will get soggy. And just top with this. Look how many vegetables you just had. Four. Four different types of vegetables with all different kinds of micronutrient value inside. And then with avocado, pretend I'm doing that. And you just wrap it like this and like that. And you're done. Okay? Some alternatives would be, thank you. Some alternatives would be to use a banana with peanut butter or almond butter, honey if it's, if it's within your glycemic profile, um, salmon with mayonnaise and pickles, the same topping. I mean, just let your imagination go wild. Just put a nice healthy protein. A lot of us aren't eating enough protein with every meal, and protein is very important for brain 
um, function. So if you feel a little foggy, tr making sh make sure that you're eating enough protein. And keep in mind that you are unique. The amount of protein, the amount of carbohydrates, and the amount of fats that you need to ingest are different than your neighbor. And pay attention. Get a coach. Come talk to me and see what we can do together. Thank you, Dr. Bro. Thank you, Pennington and Whole Foods Market. And I think we're done. Do we have time for any more questions? We have one more. Your vegetables and fruits are not quite as fresh. Eat them quick. She wants to know, like, what do you do when your vegetables are going bad? Oh, soup. Make a rainbow stew. Just get some sort of broth, whatever you know is your favorite uh, vegetable, beef, or chicken. Have that as your base, and just do a little onion, garlic, and throw them all in there. Do smoothies. Just put them in your body quick. At, right outside at my table. Yes. Feelgoodmama.com. And that's Dana. She's my plant. <laughs> I was told I wasn't supposed to do that, but I had to answer your question. <laughs> Could you address the concept of chewing a lot? Yes, mindful chewing. Mindful eating. She's asking a question about chewing, or she's driving this conversation, and I thank you for that. Um, it is very important. We often, we're going to grab this, and then we're going to be eating in the car, dealing with traffic. Let's try to at least pull over while you're doing it. And, ch and chew your food because that's going to activate your enzymes that are gonna help break down your food. It's no good to put it in your body if you're not digesting it. Am I right? And you're also connecting to gratitude when you're doing that. It's not a mindless behavior, it's a mindful behavior that has a calming effect on our bodies, reduces stress. It's very, very important. Thank you for that. Oh, those are walnuts. Yes, ma'am. Let's talk later. That's a, that's a big conversation. Well, thank you so much.